Information contained in this podcast is not medical advice. It is for educational and informational purposes only. Please consult with your doctor before making any health choices. You're listening to the Take Back Your Health Now podcast, the show that interviews the top doctors, athletes, trainers, and entrepreneurs to help you find the holy grail of health. Now here's your host, Dr. Dan Margolin. Hi, this is Dr. Dan Margolin with another segment of Take Back Your Health Now, where we pull out all the stops in search of health's holy grail. What an exciting show we have today. We have uh, Scott Kalbaba, MD, a practicing internist. He's interviewed 200 courageous physicians who came forward with 26 of the most miraculous experiences of their careers. These stories have been chronicled in his new book, Physicians Untold Stories. Dreams foretelling future events, apparitions, and other miraculous experiences come to life within its pages. Meant to awe, instruct, and inspire, these tales will convince even the harshest skeptic that there are things beyond the physical world, and sometimes all we need to do is believe. Dr. Kalbaba is now bringing his message of spiritual love and hope to thousands through his many speaking engagements, radio, and podcast interviews. Uh, Dr. Kalbaba, welcome to the show, sir. Thanks, Dan. It's great to be here. It's great to have you. So let's sort of let's jump in. Like, just I, I'm just so fascinated. You are uh, an internist, right? How how long have you been practicing, sir? I, I almost hate to admit it, Dan. Thirty five years. Oh, okay, good. I'm, I got thirty years, so you're you're not too far uh, too far beyond me. What um what inspired you? Like, did you have some uh, of your own uh, situations that like what inspired you to write the book? You know, I think it started with an experience I had with one of my patients that was uh, traveling to uh, to uh, one of the southern states, and he called me up in the middle of the, toward the end of the end of the night, and he said, "I've got this abdominal pain that I that I got after eating a large meal. It's a, a upper abdomen on the right side, and everyone knows the gallbladder is there, and it sounded like a gallbladder attack." And I said, "Get over to the emergency room and and uh, have them take take a look at you and see what's going on." And he did. They did the uh, ultrasound. They did the blood tests. Everything was all normal. And the doc that called me up said, uh, you know, when he comes back to Chicago, I'll send him, I'll have him come back and see you because we gave him a shot of Demerol here. He's fine now, but uh, it sounds like all about me too, but we can't find it. So a couple of days later, he showed up in my office and we went over his records and everything was normal. And I said, well, it, obviously it sounds like all about right upper abdominal pain after eating. And he still was having the pain. So we got a specialized uh, gallbladder s- a scan, some additional uh, fancier blood tests and, and everything turned out to be perfectly normal. I was really troubled by that, but I couldn't figure out why, uh, uh, what, what the what the problem was, and it's really disconcerting when you have a patient that's really hurting and you can't sort it out. So, a couple of days later, I, I was I was thinking about him, and I woke up in the morning and I had the the distinct impression that I needed to order a lung scan. Now that didn't make any sense to me because he had an abdominal pain, not not a lung pain, but I just couldn't get out of my my mind. So I called him up and I said. Uh, you know, we we need to we need to get a lung scan because I, I have this feeling that there may be something related to your lung, but I'm not sure. Wow. I, wow. And, I, and I felt a little strange in doing <laughs> doing that because it didn't make a lot of sense. But I just couldn't get that out, out of my, my my head. I had that, that feeling. It was like, like an well, intuition you were feeling. It was like it was. some sort of an intuition. Okay. It was. And and uh, he said, well, I can't do it today because I'm flying out to Denver. And, and I thought, oh, my goodness, uh, what if there is something going on? And so I said, what time is your flight? And he said, the early afternoon. And I said, well, if I can get a lung scan in, in the morning, would you, would you go for it? And he hemmed and hawed, and he finally said, okay, if you can get it in right away. So I called the hospital and organized a lung scan, which was uh, quite a feat in itself to get an emergency lung scan. So he went over there, and about an hour later, I got a call from the radiologist, and he said, a good call, Scott. And I said, what do you mean? He said he had a massive blood clot, a pulmonary embolus, on his diaphragm on the right oh. side that was causing his abdominal pain. And had he flown out today, he probably would have died because he would have had other uh, blood clots. Oh, my God. So I got I the mean, goosebumps. That's unbelievable. That's <laughs> unbelievable. I yeah. mean, you know, you know, what's funny that that I'm sure people that are listening to this don't realize sometimes, like as a physician, when you when you do have a patient comes in that comes in and things aren't going according to plan, it it really does eat at you. It right? does. It's not right, and it and does. especially something like this. Had he gotten on that plane and had he had an embolism or something like that, something you have to live with, right? It's, it's, oh yeah. It was 
I would have felt terrible the rest of my life, you know, thinking that I missed his blood clot and caused him to die. And what's interesting is we put him right in the hospital, obviously, and got him on blood thinners. We discovered that he had a hereditary clotting disorder that made him predisposed to having blood clots, which is why he had the blood clot. So this wow. was quite a thing. So when I when that happened to me, I, I began to think about, I wonder if other docs have had an, an experience, because that was the first experience I'd ever had with anything that I recognized. Now, in retrospect, as I look back at my life and my career, there are lots of times when I've, I've had those kinds of things happen to me that I didn't recognize. And I think many people have those kinds of experiences that they don't do you recognize. Think we, do you think we poo-poo them because we don't want, it's not really maybe as well accepted, it's not accepted by our colleagues and stuff like that? Sure we do. Sure we do. And I think when you have a, a coincidence, uh, you think, oh, this is just a little coincidence. This is nothing, this is nothing uh, uh, that's that's directing me into this, uh, this, this cure or this interesting uh, 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 diagnosis. And so I let that slip after a while. I kind of forget about it. You know, you have a busy day and you have a busy life and I'm a busy doc. So, so, um, but then about um, a month or two later, two doctors within a week of each other came to me with unusual stories. And I, I thought about those stories and I thought doctors must have had these experiences uh, more wow. than I realize because docs don't talk about this stuff. As you know, you know, we talk about, uh, uh, surgeries and our golf game and and but we don't talk about right this. very conservative conversations yes. very conservative right? yeah. yes absolutely Nothing's but wait like what so they just came to you out of the blue like why yeah. why at that point in your life did they come to you you know I you can call it a coincidence but I think it was probably more than a coincidence that these two docs happened to come to me within a week of each other with very unusual stories that made me wonder if other docs had stories. And I started to ask, you know, and they, I got up in the early morning and, and would get to the uh, physician's lounge. I'd hang out there and I'd ask docs if they had any stories that they, they couldn't explain scientifically. And I was shocked. And how did they like, how did they take that? First of all, were they eager to open up to you or were they a little bit more hesitant or some docs were eager to open up and, and say, you know, yes, I, I've got this story. Uh, most docs were a little, shy and a little conservative and i had to kind of pull it out of them but it's interesting the docs that had the stories knew that they had a story right away they would say yeah i've got a story but i'm not going to tell you or, or wow. whatever. but so the ones that knew knew they had some special spiritual story that they couldn't explain and i got to to recording some of those stories and i i've realized that there were a lot of docs. I interviewed ultimately 200, about 200 docs. And I, wow. I went to one of my patients who was a publisher, who was a president of a publishing house, and I sat down uh, with him for lunch. And I told him a few stories, and I, and I was asking him you know, to listen to these stories to see if they, he thought they had any, any uh, worth to, to publish, because I'm, I'm a doc. I'm not a writer. I'm not a publisher. I'm not an author. Right, right. Had you ever written anything, any published books no, prior nothing, to this? nothing at all, not even okay. an article. So gotcha. I was eating lunch with him, and I was busy eating lunch while I was telling stories, not paying attention to what he was doing. All of a sudden, he stopped eating, and I looked up to see what he was doing, and he had tears in his eyes. No. Wow. And I thought, here's a guy that listens to stories and books all the time who is moved, physically moved by these stories. There must be something here. And he said, you have to publish this book because these are moving stories that people need to hear about. So that's what got me, got me into it. Wow. Wow. And, and as you go through this process of, of speaking to physicians and getting these stories, how do you change or had you changed from that original experience already? I, I, was, I was surprised that there were so many of these stories. And it, and it, it, it really changed me into believing that there is something else out there. I always believed in God. But it really gave me a sense that that our God or whatever it is you believe in uh, has a hand in our lives in, in strange and wonderful ways. And more than I ever realized before, that coincidences are frequently not coincidental and that they, wow. there may be things that happen to people that they never realized were meant to help them move forward, to become well, uh, to help people uh, in general. So... It was eye-opening for me, and after talking with all these docs, I, I strengthened my faith and my belief that there is something else 
that takes a, takes part in our lives almost on a daily basis in many cases. Now, now Doc, when you speak to these doctors, do you find, and, and I'm just wondering, because a lot of times you, 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 I get the impression that many doctors are very clinically based, right? There again, like we spoke of conservative, yes. and that when you start to talk about a spiritual aspect to to humanity and mankind and stuff like that, they might give it a slight nod, but they're not particularly living in that realm. Is that just a, a conservative mask, or not really? Or, or in other words, do they? Do they actually buy in that there is a spiritual component to life uh, on average or not so many much? Many of the doctors do. And many of the doctors are afraid to show that side of themselves because they're afraid of being criticized. Because, okay, okay. Dan, think about this. You go to a doc, you've got a particular issue, a knee problem or something, and uh, the doctor says, well, I had a dream about you or I had a, a vision or something. You think, this doc is crazy, you know? So, right, right. So uh, most of the docs and, and the docs that I, that I interviewed, uh, I made sure were very reasonable, conservative, scientific docs uh, that weren't out in left field and, and didn't have hundreds of stories about crazy stuff. And so these were ordinary docs that, that lots of people go to. And they right. were afraid to tell the stories. And I was afraid to pursue this. But but. We did, and I, and I think the reason that we did, and, and they allowed me to publish these stories, is because of one thing I called I called the docs in the book sappy do-gooders. They, they want to do some good every day of their lives. They want to help someone. They want to cure something. They want to do some good. Wow. And I think they realized that these stories would help people get through this crazy life. It would help give them hope that there's something else out there, and that sometimes if they have faith and believe that uh, that they could be cured, that, that things can happen to them that they would never realize before. Wow, that is powerful. Dr. Kalbaba, I'm going to jump in and ask you some of the stories, but I'm going to share one of my own, uh, which I have never told really anybody. So I'm going to, I'm going to share it with you in the audience awesome. a little bit. But the absolutely true story happened last year to me. It's on a Thursday evening. I'm watching television, and I just get the thought, of uh, uh, someone I, I wrestled in high school. I'm 55 now, so that was over 35 years ago. Um, and his name was Patsy. I've never thought about Patsy in 35 years, ever. Like, just never. But all of a sudden, I had a thought about him to the point. Now, this is also not like me, that I got up from watching television at night, and I went to the computer, and I Googled his name, and I found things like his uh, uh, that his sister had been sick and other things. I, I literally spent 20 minutes. Matter of fact, he had divorce papers. I started reading through his divorce oh papers. Okay, And I'm sitting there and doc, this is not me. Mm -hmm. I would never do. And I'm like, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> and I, I closed everything out. And I said, you know, my last thought was, I, it's been 35 years. I should give him a call and just see how he's doing. And anyway, totally forgot about it. Now that's Thursday night. Saturday morning, I get up to get up early. We work on Saturday. So I, I get up, turn on my computer, check my Facebook. And when the Facebook pull, pulls up, it is a picture of Patsy right there when he was younger, back to almost the time when we had been wrestling. Oh and I thought, oh, I must have left open. You know, I thought, you know, sometimes you leave yeah. open a, a page. I thought maybe I left open a page. And no, it was his obituary. He had died that Thursday. Oh he had goodness. died the night. Okay. And I, it, it sent chills down my spine. But then to just – and if you look at the odds of this, okay, I'm telling you, I never in 35 years had any thoughts of Patsy. Honestly, I just totally forgot about it. So for that to come up at that same day, you know, I, I looked at it and I said, well, 35 years, 365 days in a year, yeah. you know, it's something like 1 in 12,000 chances of that happening, oh. okay? But then – I have a patient, this lady, Maureen, who also been coming to my office for many years. And I walked in uh, about a week later. I, she came in and I walked in the room and uh, we were talking and she goes, uh, Doc, I need to tell you something that's going to shock you a little bit. And I'm like, what's that? She goes, well, you don't know this about me, but I'm, I'm I don't know what they say, clairvoyant or something mm -hmm. like that. She goes, and, and there is a spirit of a, a gentleman standing right next to you. Oh, my. And. Anyway, so that's my story. Yeah. So I don't know how that fits into the stories you've heard, right. but that is absolutely true. Yeah. And whatever it was, you call it a coincidence, um, but it, it was startling. It was certainly startling. You no, know, Dan, what I've discovered in telling these stories, uh, especially to the patients in the office, is almost all of them have had stories like yours. And they come back to me and say, 
you know, I'm, I'm glad you told me that story because I've got one myself that I just couldn't explain. And I, I, I'm afraid to tell anyone because I think people think I'm nuts. They'll criticize me. And I think one of the things that has come from this book is that people feel uh, that it's okay to tell these stories. And I'm delighted that, that they, right. they feel that way because when doctors who are scientists uh, have had these experiences, I think it gives people permission to tell their own stories and, and get them out. And, and I think that's wonderful. Wow. You know, you're right. You, you really, I think sometimes it takes the courage to be the first one to sort of start the conversation, but then once you open up the floodgates, right? right. I mean, this is not, this is not something I've really ever told anybody because it wasn't, there was no real platform, right? right? There was, it wasn't something that you would just go, Hey, by the way, you know, so uh, doc, so as you're doing the story, tell us some of the stories that had the greatest impact on you or that were the, whatever the most startling or, or, or in some way, uh, well, we've got a, as a story I'll tell you later on about the very thing that you experienced with with a patient that that had died and then and and then uh, came to to my partner actually but I'll, I'll, I'll tell that one so there's, there's, there's a number of stories like that but I think one of my favorite uh, stories is is a, a Steve Heim story Steve Heim is an orthopedic surgeon a back surgeon a trauma surgeon who was skiing in Colorado with his wife and his wife's sister. And, and they're expert skiers. Steve's in incredible shape. He can do a thousand push-ups and a thousand sit-ups and he and at age 60. And he's you know an amazing wow. condition, which is about a thousand more than I can do. So, <laughs> so they were skiing down this mountain they've never been on before. And, and when they got to the top of the mountain, it's uh, in Colorado, they, it, a blizzard hit and the snow came down. Like crazy, he was going sideways. The wind was blowing. The temperature dropped about thirty or forty degrees, and they had to ski down in in poor visibility. They could hardly see anything in front of them, but they could see about ten feet in wow. front. This was a brand new mountain they'd never been on before, so they didn't know where they were going. So they started skiing down because they had to get down off the mountain with this terrible blizzard that hit. And they came to a patch of trees right in the middle of the run, so they had to go to the right or the left. And and the girls went to the left and. Steve thought they, they were going to the right, and he, Dr. Heim, went to the right. And, and when they realized that the girls weren't with him, he decided to ski back through the, to the, the grove of trees. He said to me, when he started to ski back through the grove of trees, something really strange happened to him. Everything became quiet. Even though the wind was blowing, it was just like a silence. He could hear the snow under his skis. He had this feeling of dread inside of his chest. You know how you get that feeling that there's something awful happening. And he couldn't he didn't, sure, he didn't sure. know what it was. And he, and he felt compelled when he got pretty much in the middle of this grove of trees to just stop skiing. And he had no idea why he, why he stopped skiing. And he stood there for a minute wondering, what, I'm, what am I doing here? The snow is coming down, but I've got this feeling that I'm being called to do something with, that has life and death proportions, and I'm not sure what it is. Oh, my God. So he's standing there. Uh, the girls are, uh, were waiting for him. He didn't know that, but the girls were waiting for him on the other side of the grove of trees because they knew he would ski back to them. And then he decided to take his skis off and climb up the hill, climb up the mountain. So he's climbing and walking and climbing and walking, gets about 20 or 30 yards up the mountain, comes to this big pine tree right in the, right in the middle of his path. He had to either go around it or, or go back. And he looked down and he realized why he was there. Under the tree in the well that's formed by the snow that comes down to the base of the tree, there's a body covered with snow. Oh, you couldn't see it unless you were right on top of the tree. It was all covered. It was all oh. covered with snow. It didn't like. It looked like he was dead. But Steve's a trauma surgeon. What better person to come across the body in the middle of the woods, in the middle of a mountain uh, storm, than a, than a trauma surgeon? So he brushed off his head to see if he was breathing, and he couldn't see that he was breathing. His head looked, his face looked gray. He thought he was dead. But he, but as a trauma surgeon, he put his hand on his carotid artery in his neck to feel if he had a pulse. And sure enough, he had a thready pulse. It was a pulse, but it was very weak. Oh, wow. So he was in shock. So S Steve went into the trauma mode. He brushed the snow off. He took his jackets off, covered them, started yelling for help, help. Uh, one of the last skiers down the mountain heard his cry for help, came to his side, and he said, what can I do? And Dr. Heim said, go call the ski patrol as soon as you can get to a phone. So about 15 minutes later or so, he saw the light from the ski patrol with a snowmobile and a gurney being pulled by the, the snowmobile. They loaded this unconscious, hypothermic, shocky skier onto the gurney, covered him up, and zipped him back off to the lodge where they had an ambulance waiting to take him to the hospital. By this time, Dr. Heim was shaking with adrenaline and cold, and he put his jackets back on and, and skied back to where the girls were still waiting for him. They skied down the mountain, 
And he got his reward there from the the ski patrol for saving this guy or or finding him, which was a cup of hot chocolate. Wow. The next day he called the hospital and he said, what's, you know, what, what happened to this guy? And they said, he's perfectly fine. He woke up this morning. He's talking, he's eating. He looks great. He did a great job splinting his broken leg in the field with your underclothes and a tree branch. Oh my God. And uh, he's, he's perfect. He's perfectly fine. And Dr. High realized that had he not found this skier, he would have frozen to death and they may not have found him until the spring. Cause it was, you know, he was way under this tree and uh, he obviously hit the tree. Oh my God! What is the chances of that happening? I mean, zero, that's what, basically. That's what Dr. Right? Heim said. This is this was not any. This was not a coincidence. This was I was directed to this gear, and um, and I, I said, well, was this an important person? Was he a senator or something? Was he again? You know, what is he a big? And no, he was a he was a contractor from Boulder, and and uh, uh, you know he was probably pretty special to his family, but he didn't have any national recognition or anything like that. So. Uh, just an individual that somebody upstairs, Dr. Heim said, uh, wanted to have me save. But what's interesting? Wow, that's amazing. What's interesting about that story, Dan, is when I talked with Dr. Heim, I said, "Steve, you know, what do you think about this?" And he said, "Well, that day, two people were saved." I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "Well, I, the skier was saved, but I was saved too." And I said, "What do you mean by that?" And he said, "Well, two years before this, my father was skiing with me in Michigan." We were doing cross country skiing. He arrested on the on the trail. I ran him down to the lot, to the uh, first aid station, which was equipped by a doctor. Interestingly, we did CPR for an hour, but we lost him. And, oh. and he said, "I've had that guilt of losing my father because I thought I was responsible for his." Wow! Wow! We we lost. We got you at the point that you said that he lost. Uh, he was uh, upset because he thought he was responsible for his father's yeah. death and that that this actually re i guess gave him back the the faith that, that things yes. are going to be okay yeah. he realized that he wasn't responsible for life and death that someone else was and he ultimately thought that his dad was probably in on this on this scheme to to help uh, him realize that the, the guilt should be his, his own guilt so why wow. do you find that that people uh through the stories uh are also telling you about the change that they had gone through not just telling you the story but that the effect that it I had think on so. them i think so because uh, many of the docs that that have had these experiences have had their faith strengthened uh i had one doc who um, now is the president of a of an evangelical college and uh, he had a, he had an experience that that changed his life and and made him very uh, profoundly religious and, and uh, uh, strengthened his faith. And, and he now is involved with uh, a church and, and uh, a religious school for, for uh, wow. What was, what was that story? This was an interesting story. Uh, this is Dave Geeser, who's an ophthalmologist. And Dave was uh, in high school, was uh, playing uh, s- uh, soccer with, with his uh, high school team. And uh, he was a uh, goalie. And when the uh, other team had the ball and approached him, he was kicked in the in the flank by a, uh, an approaching forward that was trying to kick the ball into the goal. Instead of kicking the ball, he kicked him in the side. And, and Dave told me this was the most oh. excruciating pain he has, he's ever had. It ruptured his kidney, basically, is what happened. Oh. Went oh. to the hospital. He was urinating blood. He was in extreme pain. He was in so much pain, he told me, that he could, he could really do nothing but just lay there in bed. And he couldn't even watch TV. He was in so much pain. And that went on for a few days, and, and finally the urologist came in and said, and, and didn't say to him, but said to his, his mother, we're going to have to take his kidney out because uh, he's in too much pain. Oh. He's, he's got this obviously ruptured kidney. It's not going to be functional. And uh, so they scheduled him for surgery that next Monday. This thing, I think, happened on a Tuesday. So on Friday, he was just laying there in, in extreme pain, just watching the clock, I mean, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock. And, at 10 o'clock, something happened, and he, he, he didn't quite know what to make of it. And he, he didn't realize that the pain had, had, had disappeared. And he thought it was just huh. a, maybe a coincidence. I just got in a comfortable position. But he wanted to test it out, so he twisted to the right and twisted to the left. There was no pain. Sat up, no pain. Was bold enough to get out of bed for one of the first times and walk to the bathroom. No pain whatsoever. No blood in his urine. Everything was fine. The next the next wow. day, the doctor came in, realized that he was perfectly fine, discharged him from the hospital. He recovered at home for the next week or two. Finally went back to school, 
and I uh, was talking to one of his teachers and he said, you know, Dave, we were really, really worried about you. And when we found out, even though you didn't know, we found out that you were going to lose your kidney that, that, that Monday, we decided that uh, as a faculty to have a faculty prayer. And, um, oh my and Dave God. said, well, when did you have that? Well, and the professor said, well, that was, that was that, that Friday after you had the accident at 10 o'clock. Wow. Wow. His pain was gone at 10 o'clock. Dave said that story strengthened my faith and, and made me believe that there is someone that looks out for us, someone above us that uh, is God, and, and that uh, uh, he saved my kidney and saved, uh, and saved me from, from that uh, surgery. Unbelievable. You know, I think these stories are far more common. I, I really, I mean, I've heard stories just from a few <laughs> friends and things. So I think when you, like you said, you, you had the courage to start this conversation. And uh, I, I bet you these are so much more common than we would think just because nobody's really uh, of your of your stature or whatever really started the conversation. I heard that there was some story about, and I might totally sure. be butchering this, but uh, it, was, it was about a, a doctor I became a doctor and his father said, you know, you're not really a doctor yet. When you will become a doctor, you'll recognize it. And there was some accident or a yeah, bus this, accident. This is a this? story I heard uh, when I was on another podcast. So I, I can't I can't document. I was real careful in the book documenting these are all true stories that, that happened. This was one I heard on the podcast. Okay. So it's a great story, but I, I can't tell you with 100% certainty that, that, that this the validity of the story, but it's a, it's a great story. Uh, the, the, the doctor uh, was just uh, graduated from from medical school and residency program, and his father, who was a doctor, said, "You're not a doctor yet until you have uh, an experience." And the, and the doc, young doctor, thought, "This is a little bit crazy. You know, what kind of experience can I can I have? I'm I did all this work. I'm finally a doctor. Aren't you proud of me?" And the, his dad said, "You're going to have that experience." Well. He didn't know what he meant. He's still a little offended, but he was driving in California uh, on the expressway, and all of a sudden um, he saw this this uh, kid waving hysterically to exit to turn off on the exit, uh, and so he, um, he 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 turned off there and felt pretty compelled to do that, and looked at the kid, and the kid had a sweatshirt on and, and said his name on the back of the sweatshirt, and and he pulled off and there he saw down in the, in the valley where he couldn't see it from the expressway it was a bus accident the bus had had, uh, had a serious accident no one was there he was the first one there so he jumped into the jumped out of his car ran into the bus was helping all the kids with bleeding stopping the, the bleeding and and you know, dealing with what he could do and finally got to the front of the bus and um, uh, he, he found a kid that, that was laying there at the front of the bus and um, he turned him over, and, and he, unfortunately, he had, he had died. It was, yeah. it was the same wow. kid that waved him to get off the expressway. Wow. Wow. That, you know, that, that sends chills up your spine, yeah. After right? After that, his dad said, you've had the experience. You're, gonna, you're a doctor now. So, so his dad obviously yeah. knew. Yeah. So it's a great story. That's a great wow. story. So. Yeah. What was uh, we've got time for one more story? You said at the beginning, I think there was a story that that you're going to say. I, I don't know if you had said that one yet. Um, yeah, there's there's one I particularly like. It's the Grandma Hanlon story. Do you remember that one by any chance? Uh, about Grandma Hanlon. No. Grandma no. Hanlon uh, was a midwife uh, uh, a while ago, and uh, she came from Ireland where there was a lot of conflict with the Catholics and Protestants, and she was quite a leader in her family with spiritual things, and she used to work for free if the people couldn't afford her mid midwifery uh, charges. And so she uh, became older, uh, had to retire, and, and, and lived with Dr. Heitzler's wife, uh, Joan. And Dr. Heitzler is an a, a obstetrician gynecologist that, that, that delivered a couple of our kids, actually. And his wife, Joan, uh, this, was, this was her grandmother. And so she lived with Joan uh, for a while, and uh, Joan's mother uh, took care of her and... and uh, and Joan used to say, if I can make it to Grandma Hanlon's lap, uh, I know I'll be safe. <laughs> so if she got in trouble, she'd run to Grandma Hanlon. Uh -huh. <laughs> so Joan was delivering her fifth child uh, and uh, with Dr. Heitzler. And Dr. Heitzler wasn't doing the delivery because, you know, it's not nice to be your own doctor for your wife. So he had his partner do the delivery. And afterwards, Joan became quite uncomfortable with the pain. 
And so they decided to give her a, a drug called Trilene, which is administered by mask. It's like a gas, and it puts the person totally asleep, unconscious, and they can do the rest of the procedure that they need to do after delivery. And um, all of a sudden, Grandma Hanlon walks into the room. She's dressed in her little polka dot dress with a sweater vest and her hair up in a bun and old lady shoes. And she stood at the foot of the bed, and, and she signaled to Joan, don't, don't take that Trilene. And Joan didn't understand why because she was in pain, but she pushed it away and didn't take it. Well, no one realized that Joan had eaten a large meal right before she went into labor. And about a minute after she pushed the trilene away, she vomited the entire meal. Oh. And she had the mask on and been unconscious. It could have been very serious or even fatal to have that much. She could have died. Absolutely. So Joan says she made it to Grandma Hanlon's lab one last time, transcending time and all eternity because Grandma Hanlon had died 22 years before. Wow, what a powerful, powerful story. What a powerful, powerful interview. My God. Dr. Kalbaba, thank you for these great stories. Thank you for bringing these, uh, bringing this uh, kind of spiritual nature to medicine. I mean, I think it is uh, sorely lacking, and I think it will change the viewpoint of a lot of physicians and stuff. Let me ask you, physicians that were not part of this that actually get these, the book or that you've spoken with, what's their reaction been uh, people that were removed from actually being part you of know, this book? I was shocked at the, at the re response. I thought we'd be criticized. I thought people would say this is hokey business and this is craziness and so forth, but we really haven't at all. Uh, there's been almost no criticism. Doctors uh, that read it and other people that read it uh, uh, remember their stories or their family stories. And I think everyone Almost everyone, like you, has had a story like this that they can't explain. And I think it gives them yeah. permission to, to tell that story, which has been very positive. And they, they, um, I think it helps strengthen their faith. I think it helps uh, make them realize that many coincidences that we have in this life are not coincidental, that there's something out there, there's something higher than us that directs our path for the good. Wow. Dr. Kababa, as we end the, as we come to the end of the interview, we always ask our guests what they consider the holy grail of health to be. If I were to pose that to your, to you, sir, what, 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 what do you think the holy grail well, of I health think, is? I uh, think, in re regard to this book, in regard to these stories, I think uh, people need to realize that even if they have a serious condition, even if they have something that's fatal, even if they have something that the doctor says so you'll never do something. Uh, that they need to have faith. They need to believe that there is something higher than than our our existence here. That's that's better than than a pill, and that's better than than a shot or IVs or whatever. That uh, call on call on uh, what you believe. Call on the the spirit that that you believe is up there to help you. And I think that help uh, will 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 be there, and and in many cases will be uh, amazing. And so I would have people realize that to, to uh, have faith and believe. Wonderful. Dr. Kalbaba, I'm going to ask you a question. It's a little bit off, off topic here. I had heard, and you may not know this at all, but years ago I had heard there was an experiment where when, sometimes when people would go under surgery, they would uh, go exterior, they would leave their bodies. And what they did is an experiment in, the, in some ORs where they would put numbers hidden on shelves in the operating room to see if they people, when they came back, could actually see those numbers. Had you ever heard of that experiment? Or I always wondered whatever happened with I've the results. I've never heard of that, that. experiment. There's interesting experiments that? like that where people pray, for example, for people in the in the uh, ICU, and the people that are prayed for do better than the ones that aren't prayed for, even if they don't know the names of the people necessarily. So uh, there's interesting things okay. that happen. We've had wow. a, some, a near death experience in, in the book where the person uh, uh, died literally and then uh, rose to the top of the room and was able to uh, see everything that, that happened and told the doctor later on, which absolutely made the doctor un unnerved to hear about exactly what happened in the, in the OR when she was uh, arrested. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah that's, that was along those lines of what that ex experiment right. I'd heard about that. And I was always wondering what the results of that were. Well, Dr. Kalbaba, people that want to get in touch with you, want to learn more about the book, how would uh, they do it, so? The book's available on Amazon. And uh, our website is physiciansuntoldstories.com. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to hear from, from people. I'm happy to hear their stories. And we're working on a second book. So if you have some great stories, I'd love to hear them. We're also working on a potential TV series for next year also. Oh, that's great. That is great. Dr. Kalbaba, thank you so much for being on the show. It was a great interview. Thanks, I really man. appreciate it. 
This episode is sponsored by New Jersey Foot and Ankle Center in Oradell, New Jersey. Remember, when you have a foot problem, you've got a foot doctor in the family. Weekend and evening appointments are available. Call us at 201-261-9445. Once again, that's 201-261-9445. Thanks for listening. Check out the show notes over at drdanspeaks.com. If you're loving the show, head over to iTunes and leave us a review, and we'll catch you next time.